evening, everybody. My name is Dave Schloss, and I'm the liaison officer for CAL FIRE. It's been management team one. And I want to start off by uh, telling you it's been our privilege serving you these past couple weeks on this tragedy that struck your community. And we're here tonight to provide a briefing, uh, a historical look back on the fire from the beginning, and tell you where it's at now, and I'll give you some other information. I want to start off with introducing Cal Fire Tommy Calaveras Unit Chief, Josh White. Division Chief, Roy Evans. Incident Commander, Fulton Harris, from the Semester Incident Commander Training, Stephen Shaw. Commander, Colorado Unit, Division Chief, Chris Post. One Operations Section Chief, Tony Bernal. The Law Liaison Officer, Lieutenant Scott Black. Lieutenant Information Officer, Mike Muller. Over here at your left, key cooperators from local government, Sheriff Gary Coons. From the California Highway Patrol, Lieutenant Dwayne Lewis. Local government fire chiefs would be Jim Carroll from West Point, Tom Young from San Andreas, Steve Kovacs from Murphy's, Jim Rohrbrock from Alta, Altaville, Mahonis, Angel, Michael Johnson from Evans Pass. Now I'll turn it over to I'm sorry. Jeff Stone. Jeff Stone, Central Calabria. Central Calabria. Welcome to So this time I'd like to hand it off to Mike Fuller, our information officer, who will be the MC for the event. Thanks, Steve. Good evening, everyone. Um, we'll get started here. We're going to go right into our official attack incident commander, Chief Mike Oliveria. Good evening, Mike Oliver, Cal Fire and Royal Nevada Unit. So I was the uh, initial attack incident commander, and I'm just going to briefly describe the events that took place uh, at the beginning of the fire, and if we have any specific questions for me, uh, we will be around afterwards to, to handle those. So we were dispatched about 2.30 uh, in route to the fire, as I came around Vista Point there in Jackson, is when I saw the smoke for the first time. And it was a moderate smoke. Um, it didn't appear to have a you know, real very quick way to spread. Um, as I went on scene, I realized it had about four acres of fire, and it was burning from Butte Mountain Road to Chir Chiramunda Ranch Road. And we were able to uh, get some equipment in there, and we picked up the fire on Chiramunda Ranch Road at about four acres. However, the fire Fire to only spot fire about halfway down into the Colorado River drainage. So that being what it is, uh, you know, that's kind of a, a bigger, larger task to take care of once it does that. We ordered, uh, we made a pretty substantial uh, request for equipment, uh, including engines, crews, and dozers, and aircraft to handle that, you know, expanding event. Um, I moved around to a point where I could see it, and the fire behavior for the, uh, with the fire in the canyon was what you would expect it to be, uh, slow runs from the mid-slope part of the canyon up towards the top. Uh, we were protecting structures and putting lightning up the top of the canyon, and we're starting to work down the flank of the canyon to time the fire into the Columbia River. Um, things were going well um, at about 5 to 5.30, the up canyon or the diurnal wind um, subsided and the north wind surfaced and pushed the fire made a little run um, from about mid-slope down towards uh, the electric powerhouse. When it made that run, the fire had spotted over into Calaveras County. Um, at that point, we made a, another substantial resource request to Calaveras, or Tuolumne Calaveras unit, which again included additional aircraft, dozers, crews, and engines. Um, it probably, from the time we first saw the spot, I would say it was probably 10 minutes before it hit the top of the, the ring. 
when I initially saw the spot, we immediately made a, a uh, evacuation request to Calaveras County SO. Uh, talking to my partner, uh, they responded extremely quickly and got there within 10 minutes and started evacuating that Montgomery area. And then we also requested uh, Highway 26, a mile east of and a mile west of Montgomery. Once that equipment got on scene, we established that as a, an additional branch of the fire. And uh, I'll let uh, Division Chief Chris Post describe the rest. At that point, uh, we handed off the IC to him, and I took the operations with him. Thank you. Good evening, Tony Brown Ellis and Management Team 1 Operations. And operations means that I was running the, the firefighting operations during the day on the ground and Mike was running at night. So, obviously when we got here, at, at first it was already across the river and it was going into Highway 26. It was about 200 acres on the other side of 26. So when the sun, it burned pretty active all night. When the sun came up, it actually, you know, obviously it's going to pick up and go a lot faster. And with the pointer here, um, some of the predictions I've seen, it was burning over 50 acres a minute. So about 11 o'clock, it, it was across Highway 26, it was making an after run to Jesus Maria. By later that day, it was already down here in the mountain, above the Mountain Ranch area. The next day, it was all the way around Mountain Ranch, and that's where the, the fourth day was down on the bottom down there. Extreme fire behavior. So it was very difficult to get in front of it. We were worried about people out there, obviously. At one point, our firefighting aircraft were actually dropping on people trying to get ways out of the fire. So it was a very difficult fire. Today we're concentrating on really, really buttoning up our fire line, making sure it's, it's all mop, it's called mop up. It means we're putting all the hot spots out around the, the perimeter, about three to four hundred feet in. If you see all the brown spots on there, those are what we call big islands, or areas that are partially burned or not burned at all. And you still have a lot of heat in there, and that's why you guys are seeing all that smoke popping up every once in a while out there. We're actually going there and getting those things all put out. We're working around the houses, making sure the houses were all safe for repopulation at a lot of time. Because obviously the trees are weakened. There's actually what we call stump holes, which basically the fire burning underground and where the stump root system is. Um, today we actually had an incident where a firefighter stepped in a, in a stump hole and he's in the burn unit now. So those are some of the things you guys got to work about. We talk about when we do repopulation. You got to really be careful around your house because the dangers are still there. Okay? And I'm going to introduce you to Scott Black. He's going to come up and we're going to talk a little bit about the, the evacuations and how we did the evacuations and how we got you guys back in for when we repopulated the area. Hi again, my name is Scott Black. I'm the law enforcement liaison for Team 1. To talk about the process for evacuations, I work closely with, very closely, integrated with CHP, with Calaveras Sheriff's, with Navajo Sheriff's, with State Parks, all the local law enforcement around here. Thank them for getting you out of your house. They did a wonderful job. Um, and then we work closely with both operations and the incident commanders to decide when people are going to get on, uh, evacuated. We look at decision points. If the fire gets here, we're going to go and then advise for the evacuation. If it gets here, we're going to go mandatory evacuation. And these guys start getting busy and start getting people out of there. Um, it's all about your safety. It goes through a long checklist to make sure it's safe. When we get back into repopulation, again, it's all about your safety. We want to get you back in as soon as we possibly can. We know you want to get back in sooner than we let you in. We realize that. But it's all about your safety. Like uh, Chief Ronell was saying, we want to make sure there's no trees that are going to fall down on you. We want to make sure there's not live wires out there. We want to make sure there's not uh, stump holes and all this kind of stuff. So we go through a long checklist through law enforcement, fire, utilities, uh, EOCs, health, to make sure it's safe to get back in there. And that's how we start to send you back in. Uh, I'll come back to Tony so you can kind of tell you how. Uh, early on in the incident, we, we, we did something called embedding. So riding with me or when I was on the incident, I had a sergeant with me from the Calaveras, Fire, or Calaveras Police Department. So I'm from out of the area, so knowing that area in there was, you know, I had to learn the area real quick. But with him in my vehicle, we have a couple decision points. So the fire gets to a certain spot, we say we're going to evacuate this area. And the fire gets to there, we're going to evacuate that area. And the first couple days of the fire was actually burning in so many different directions. Our, by the time we figured out what our decision point was, it was already hitting it. 
So we have to give the, the law enforcement officers enough time to get in and get you out. And obviously law enforcement is not trained in firefighting, so we're putting them out ahead of the fire, which is very dangerous. So we got to give them enough time so they get enough people in place to get you guys out. Unfortunately, I know some people didn't get the word that, you know, to the reverse time one system, whatever you use in your county, that we had the officers out doing that. And one of the difficulties we had in part of the fire is people were getting the word, so we were having to go in there and get them out. And uh, it was very challenging. But once we got to that point, the fire started slowing down, we, we really made an effort to get you guys back in your house. We know it's a huge inconvenience for you guys to be away from home. The whole question is, my house still there, my house is still there. So we try to work with it, we work with, like we said, utilities, all the other companies out there. We send fire engines around every house, make sure it's safe to get back in, drop any trees that we're concerned about. And then we're able to repopulate the area, like on those maps back, you'll see kind of areas where we did it. We had to kind of do it in chunks, because we have a 71,000 acre fire, that's a lot of area to cover. So it's, it was a little bit difficult, I hope we, we get the best we can for you, and uh, we'll, we'll go on from there. Now, you know, we don't talk about fire victims, we talk about fire, fire survivors. You guys are in. Thank you. Just be careful still. Thank you, Chief. Thank you for the time. All right, now you have to listen to me. My name is Mike Fuller. I'm actually the incident information officer for uh, Team One. I'm uh, kind of giving you an idea of how information flows in an incident like this, very dynamic incident. Um, and to me, information is very important because it's my job and I think it's very important. And our title is public information officer. Is the media our ally? Absolutely. But the public is who we serve with information. It's you. It's getting you information that is uh, in a timely fashion, but it's accurate. So I kind of want to give you an overview of how information flows on an incident like this, because we get a lot of calls. Well, we need information, you know, right now or what's going on. So how it works is we have our day operations and our night operations. So let's say night operations. They come in early in the morning. They give us information. Right, and technically, they give us intelligence, intel. And what we do with that is we glean the information off that. Acreage, containment, evacuations, areas that are threatened. We take that, we put it on what we call a fact sheet, and we email that. We put it out to the press, we put it on the radio. And that happens twice a day, because then day operations goes out, they come in, they report that information, and then again, we glean that intel we turn it into information that's accurate and disseminated to you in a timely manner. That way we make sure that you know the exact acreage containment evacuations. Now if an evacuation order changes, if we have something that needs to get out immediately, uh, you know, a, a, a repopulation area, that's a news advisory. We send that out immediately because the fire is changing. But we have to make sure we give you the most accurate information. I can tell you on this fire um, that it, 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 it moves so quick that we work with operations, we work with our law enforcement partners. If you look at our information section, we literally are embedded with law enforcement and operations to make sure that we are giving you the most current, accurate information. There were several um, things that happened on this fire. Um, loss of power, loss of connectivity. We live in a world where information is instantaneous. Um, one of the things that we have to sort through in a lot of what we deal with is social media, third party information. There's nothing wrong with that, but what I ask you is if you're not getting it from the incident, you have to look at the source that it's coming from. Now again, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's, um, you know, there's Instagram, but where is that information coming from? And what happens is that rumor starts. So about 40% of that is dealing with accurate information. Do we use that? Absolutely we do. But remember the sources that you look at. It's very important that we don't start that, that we control it, and we get it out to you. I tell people I have the, the, the easiest job, well, I shouldn't say the easiest, I have the best job, and I have the hardest job. Because I get to, and all these information officers that are in the back, that have been out in the community since this fire started, and some of you have probably had contact with them, they go door to door. They go out in the community and give you that information. And I get to interact with the community along with them. The hardest part is, we're gonna be here after this incident leaves through the recovery stage, so I'll probably meet a lot of you, and then I'm gonna have to walk away from this community and go back to Southern California, where I'm from, 
of after I built all these relationships. So that's probably the hardest part. When we have an incident like this, we form what we call trap lines. These are areas and communities where people gather. It could be the um, lookout where a lot of people go to see the, the canyon that's on fire. It could be the local supermarket. It could be the local coffee shop. If you've been out, we had 22 different trap lines in both counties with, I would say, 20, 25 PIOs every day out there putting a new map, a new fact sheet, there to talk to the community. That was one of our best ways to get information out there. Not only did we do that, but we were making sure that we were at the evacuation centers to get out there and, and see the people affected you, getting you timely, accurate information. That is our job. And right now, our information officers are still engaged. We moved into what we call the recovery portion. Okay, we get you the information, but now the information we need to get to you is maybe a contact for uh, some type of recovery, you know. We work very close with the county, with all the law enforcement, the county emergency operations centers, and getting that information out to you. Um, we're going to do several more uh, community meetings. We'll make sure that's out. We're going to be working with uh, Chief White and the uh, unit here. Uh, I was wondering the attendance here. What I heard, being from Southern California, is there's a little rivalry between uh, Angel's Camp and a high school over in San Andreas. So maybe people that come over here for that, I don't know. Um, so we're going to do one out that way too. But I want to make sure that you know that information we take very, very seriously. It's something uh, we try to get to you as quick as possible so you can make a decision as, a, as, as the public of what you should do and that it's accurate. And what I'd like to do at this point is uh, we're going to have some questions. Uh, uh, Chief over there has got the microphone. What I'd like to do is we're going to field several questions, but I want you to know that we're going to stay after uh, the executive staff, the fire chiefs here, law enforcement, will be here tonight to answer every question until we're done. But if you have a question that you think everybody needs to uh, hear, uh, please go up there. Uh, he's got a microphone, so if you want. And we'll get it to the right person. Um, yes, um, every day I came out and I got the incident report. I'm from the Calavera Animal Disaster Shelter. And um, there was a noticeable hole in that disaster reporting. Um, you had all the evacuation centers, the Red Cross evacuation centers in that report, and you also had information on where people could take livestock. However, the big hole that I found is there was no place to take pets, dogs, and cats, and Red Cross shelters don't take animals unless they're service animals. So a lot of people didn't know what to do with their, their animals, and I was just curious why that information about pets was not there. Well, that's something we need to, again, we work with the County Emergency Operations Center, and I, and for our fact sheet, if that's something that we need to look at, absolutely, we would make, as far as animal control, using the county, that's something that should have been on our fact sheet. I know we did have the large animal rescue areas, but uh, that's something we'll have to look into because we did refer it to the county, but we needed something for smaller animals. We'll definitely look into that now. Thank you. Chief, we're gonna move around here because there are stoves all the way across the room. Uh, can we get on a lot of the roads that we're not supposed to be on to get back to our house? And uh, one of the amazing things that I saw is the bulldozer work that they've done to do this, the backstops and all that. But more important than that is the PG&E people. And I don't see that there's any PG&E people here. But, I, I mean, they're doing just an absolute... We do have a rep actually now, but go ahead and answer the question. <laughs> I mean, we, 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 we personally have electricity. Other people that are very near us do it, but I know their bus and their butts. And it, I personally really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you look here, uh, Cal Fire Executive staff, Executive Law Enforcement, all of our fire chiefs here, and our cooperators for utilities, it really, really is a, a cooperative effort to make, unfortunately, a large disaster come together. So, uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, yeah, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Uh, my boyfriend and I did lose our home 
he was born in the back bedroom, but we appreciate everything you've done, and we know you've worked very hard. So thank you. That's all. I again do want to say thank you. Um, I just noticed in the beginning there were some inconsistencies. It seemed like uh, different people had other information. The sheriff's department said, all oh, this road is open. You go up there, no, it's closed. Uh, you know, the dispatcher. I guess there's about six people that can actually close a road, pg &E, you know, it's Cal the Highway Patrol and that. It didn't seem like there's a, someone that was in, was in charge of that that could be, you know, a focal point where we could go and find out what was really true. Because you had people coming up from the valley and you had sheriffs there with, with guns because they knew they were going to come across some hot uh, residents there. Yeah, I'll, I'll address that. Um, as the chiefs have said, this thing happened so quick uh, and unpredictable. So between the sheriff's department and the highway patrol, we're out there, we're trying to uh, shut down the road, we're trying to make people safe, we're trying to do the evacuations. So I totally agree with you. The first day or so, there was a little disconnect there, but um, eventually once the sheriff's department's emergency <coughs> operations section got going, uh, one of our sergeants was embedded into there, providing us timely information. Um, I was at the command post out here at the fairgrounds, uh, both in the Amador and here when they moved it over here, and then the information started flowing a lot better. Um, so we, we do after action reports, we look at these issues and concerns so we can do better next time, uh, but the only thing I can tell you is I, I I'll tell you, I became a police officer because I hate fire. I mean, what these guys do is incredible. So I run from it, they run to it. So, and I, I know that it's just it, it, the initial onset of these major incidents, whether it's a fire, it's a hurricane, it's a flood. There's a lot of resources coming in. Everybody finally gets connected up, and we try to get that information as the PIO said. We're trying to get the information out to you. And uh, I know my officer at, the, at our office was posted it on Facebook, um, on our Facebook page. The Sheriff's Department was sending out uh, Nixle alerts on the evacuations, but that did take a, a couple of days. So I don't, I'm not sure if you're talking longer term or just right. Longer term, actually, even if you know, it's the fire. But there's still some inconsistency between the agencies that was going on there. And my question too is also between the counties. There was some innocent communication between the counties and to get this whole thing going. I mean, there's, there's some politics that I think we just need to step back and look, how, what happened here? How can we stop this from happening next time? We'll do that. I'll, I'll talk to you afterwards um, and get some information. But like I say, I have to do a full action after action report. I know the Sheriff's Department does that. And so uh, I would be very interested in, in being able to address that. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Yes, this uh, addresses the Cal Fire uh, web page. They followed it quite closely all through the incident. I went to the Brown Ranch. And uh, what I noticed was that the closure information was correct when they closed the road, but it wasn't. They didn't necessarily indicate when they opened. Uh, a lot of cases, the only time you could find, well, you could find out if the road was open to go and see if you had it to a roadblock, and then they would close. But the uh, bridge road was supposed to be closed on the web page for several days after it had been opened. That's a great question, and, and I'll, uh, I'm going to chime into what the lieutenant said. Uh, you have to remember in the road closures, we don't only close them for the emergency, and they move. And like the lieutenant said, we sat with all of our law enforcement partners. Those move, it may be a utility, it may be because of the fire, it may be because of the infrastructure, so those move. We ask you during these, this very dynamic situation, you can see this is a 70,000 acre fire that moved at some points, 70 feet a minute. We had to adjust those. Our job, I can tell you, and it falls on me, is public information is getting you that accurate information in a timely manner. But we have to ask you for your patience because we are trying to do that as quick as possible with our law enforcement partners, our local government cooperators, to get that out to you. And, and that's a great question, sir. We update them as soon as we can to make sure that you're safe. So our pay, we ask you for your patience, and it's something that we work on and continually improve. Um. I know that many of us who were evacuating left town and spent all that, all those many days in friends or relatives' homes. And 
and this we picked the wrong one because we had no communication whatsoever. We could use a computer and we weren't getting any news reports. The news stations did a very poor job of covering the new fire once the valley fire started. They were forgetting us. So we weren't getting much information. And I think we should have like a hotline when there's a fire where we can call and find out exactly what's going on at the minute. But other than that, you all did an awesome job. <laughs> Question. You're absolutely right, um, and, and Chief White can help me on this. As a KBGC, the radio station was absolutely amazing. Um, and Jim, Jim, Jim Keeney, is that right? I, I, but Jim, anyways, KBGC was very, very instrumental, and I agree with you, ma'am. Um, we did actually do have a hotline that was open, and we actually, for, for the first time, grabbed that hotline and put it in the command post. And to, tonight, it's still open, and we will start our with you, we actually have the contact. We are going to keep that line open, but that's something that we need to get out to you quicker. And we did have a hotline, but obviously didn't have the number, and that's something that we have to look at. So, uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to take two more questions because we have some closing comments, and then we will be available after um, all of the executive staff, local government, and law enforcement will be here to answer your questions. So, go ahead, sir. Uh, my question is addressing to the, the sheriff's department. I live up on Jesus Road. And uh, during the, the beginning of it, I had not one single sheriff come by. The uh, only reason I knew what was going on is through neighbors. And I'm uh, kind of curious as to why there wasn't anything uh, going on uh, with the sheriff department there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sergeant Anthony Ebert, the Commissioner Sheriff's Office. I'm not quite sure, are you referring to days after the evacuation or? Uh, no, um, on Thursday, I left uh, myself Thursday about 1.30. Um, you know, I think it started on Wednesday afternoon and just watching what was going on. And um, there was, I mean, literally not one sheriff car that went by up on the road at the time. Well, first I'd like to explain how our county works. This evacuation actually, existed off Highway 4 to Highway 26. It's quite a bit of area, right? right? We started the night with the fire with four personnel up. We only had four. So when this happened and the fire started breaking out and evacuations had to take place, we only had four guys on to start the evacuation process. We started notifying mutual aid, and as our mutual aid sources started coming, we started dispatching them to certain locations where we got updated with how fire devices where the evacuation areas go. Those had our priority. We tried getting in front of this fire. Um, like Chief said earlier, this fire was moving 70 feet per minute. Our roads don't go, you know, street one through street, you know, 100, then A through Z. So it was one of those things where we did everything we can with mutual aid by assigning up certain roads and tagging. Um, I guarantee Jesus Maria was tagged. Oh, I'm sorry. Regarding tags, uh, we personally go door to door. We have to send a deputy car up into your neighborhood, up your driveway, to actually knock on the door to verify that if somebody's home. Uh, once we get the verification that it's somebody's home or, or it's not home, we tag the house. We usually tag it with some type of parking tape, and then we proceed to the next one. Um, as for Thursday, without knowing the exact time and actually having all the, the record keeping, I wouldn't know exactly what time Jesus Maria got actually got back there. Cal Fire utilizes reverse 911. 
No, when they said that you would be notified by reverse 911 from the sheriff's office. Okay, so it's a communication. So again, this is one of those things that we'll go back. We'll be working with the sheriff's office to review the system and find out what we can improve upon. What we identified earlier is that when those power lines came down, the telephone lines are down. So we still have power in the store. I understand. I'm not talking about your specific situation because unfortunately I don't know. But what we're going to do is try to identify because the Nixon system is one that the sheriff's office uses. And it, it's something that we can discuss afterwards and be able to share the information. But the Nixel seemed to work really well in those areas that have cellular service. That's one of the, the problems with Nixel. If you have cellular service in there, it's a good system. And everybody in Calaveras should sign up for the Nixel service. There's no cell service in Calaveras County. I know it's very good. <laughs> Regarding um, the percentage of areas that remain unpopulated, um, if there are any, I'm not aware. Um, and how many roads, if any, are still closed? And then for the next few weeks, what the time frame is for cleanup, what that's going to look like, and um, any dangers that we should be aware of, like you know, mudslides if there's rain, things like that. What should we be prepared for and um, careful of? All right, and I'll fill this one if nobody finds. You want to jump up? No? Okay, I got it. <laughs> okay, to answer your qu first question, the entire area is repopulated. All of the roads are open, but we have a lot of utility work going on. So pg e is working feverishly right now. They had over 50, they identified over 15,000 trees that they would have to take down because of the fire damage and that, would, that they knew immediately would come in contact with or potentially come in contact with those power lines. So they're working to restore power, to get those power lines up. I think, um, Mr. Reeves, was it 680 poles that had to be replaced? Somewhere in that neighborhood? 900. 900 poles for them to replace, and that includes some of the uh, transmission lines that were down out of the lifetime. So they have a lot of work to do. In the future, when we start talking about rains, we all we are going to have to all definitely be aware of the potential for the mudslides and that rain wash off. So it, it, this is going to be a long-term um, awareness for us as we go through and, and recover from this. Does that answer everything? Yeah, it was multi-question, so how long should you know, that you're doing now walking through putting a hot mud? And we referred, so the, the question is how long for us to continue mop up or cleaning up all of the hot spots. And, and that's really probably going to be going on throughout the rest of the season until we get rains. We're going to have local, we're holding on to a lot of resources uh, for as long as we can. But you're going to see the local Tuolumne Calvary student personnel going out, continuing to mop those smokes up. We'll be tasking some of our local government friends to come out and help us from time to time if we need to. But that's one of the benefits of repopulation is that once people get back in, Calaveras is resilient. So I know that a lot of the time somebody might see a smoke and go take a little cup of water and dump it on the floor down with it. But on the same token, it also puts the eyes and ears out there for us to be able to look, find, the, find those smokes. Call us up. Let us know where they, what the address is. We're doing that constantly right now. If you're identifying those smokes, we'll come up and take care of those. Let's do a couple more questions if you don't mind. It's concerning trees. Uh, how to identify? Who would we get in touch with to identify trees that have been damaged that could potentially fall? Or what do we? Are they are they going to go ahead and die, or which ones would fall? Um, and I just might add also, we live on Susbury Road, and then got any kind of evacuation at all, or tagging of any sort. But right now, that's behind behind us. Uh, right now, I think we have to look to the future, and the trees are an issue for our houses. I'm sure a lot of people are finished with this. And, you know, what, what is the resource that can come out and tell us you have to take that one down, or that one's going to live, or that one's... As far as identifying specific trees around your property that need to be removed, there's a number of different choices. You could hire an arborist to come out. Now, I know that that sounds, we're talking about a lot, 71,000 acres, essentially, to be to be looked at. There's going to be an enormous strain. Right now, as far as life safety, if you're concerned about a specific tree, grab a fire truck. If you see a fire truck in your neighborhood, ask them, we have to, there's we have a lot of people out there right now, ask them if it's life safety. 
is this a hazard trait? Does this need to be removed? But in the, in the coming months, I mean, we're going to be out there um, for the Tuolumne Calaveras unit. We have three outstanding foresters. Reach out to us at, at Cal Fire. We'll, we'll be able to try to get somebody out there and take a look. But we're also going to be working very closely with the county um, and, and identifying those specific requests that people have and identifying different sources of information for you. As far as backfire goes, 
is our, our standard our operations, any back firing operation goes, has to run through the operations section, unless it's a threat to life or immediate need to do so. So if they're in those houses and they, have, they were threatened by fire, they laid down some fire to try to save that house, unfortunately there's a bad effect to it. And we don't condone that. But we have to give them some operational longevity to do things like that to save the house or save their lives. And also, you know, we talked about Jesus Maria, we were talking about the firefighters not engaging out Jesus Maria. There's a couple things going on. We're focused on certain areas, okay? We're going to try to focus our resources as limited as they were to save as many houses as we can. And at the time of Jesus Maria, when the fire was going through there, we had a very large concern about firefighter safety. Because you see, have you guys driven down, I'm sure, you've seen how it burned. So we took a 100 year growth of the fire that some of this area here hasn't burned for 100 years. So, and then we're in this street drought. We're not going to ask our firefighters to trade life and property. We're going to make them focus on where they go. Now, if you have specific issues where you saw some firefighters doing something they weren't supposed to, we want to hear about it. Because we can't fix problems we don't see. Okay? Um, like I said, we don't condone it, and it should have been happening. If it did, we apologize, and we'll take care of it because we know exactly who it is. That's your question. Uh, the, the only other question I have is about commentary water sources and some properties that burned down when you had. Obviously, this, this area here is, is dry, right? And water sources were a premium. So if they saw a water source they needed to use and they, and they had to use it, they had to do it. And it's hard for us to know exactly where the, every water tank goes to, what it flows to, and how it's fed back in. So they might have had a meeting need for to get some water out of somewhere they need to go to, to put out another house or save another house. And our main priority is save the life. So if we go out there in front, put some fire out to save the community, that's what we're gonna do. And you see this area that's kind of that's all red in the middle? Right? At one point in the fire, we had to circle our entrance in that whole community to try to save that whole community. And those firefighters were totally totally surrounded by fire for a while to the point where that one said they had to get in what we call safety zones to save themselves once the fire calmed down but they went back in their state all the safety they did. So believe me, don't judge all the firefighters by the actions of a few. And I'm not saying you are, but there was some great firefighting efforts done out here to save every house they could. We did not intentionally burn out any house. I can tell you that right now. Okay? It's, that wasn't our priority. Okay? I'm not sure whether we can low kill and I have four questions, but two of them have been answered. I'll talk to CHP afterwards and KVGC. Thank you. Someone brought up KVGC. Um, my number two question was, um, we have fire subcontractors in our county, and um, Herzig was a mile, for example, from a mile where the fire crossed. These subcontractors are on the list, but they don't get called right away. They're pulling people in from an hour. I have no idea. But what, do you, can you really make an effort to pull the subcontractors or close to the fire to get them involved right away? And I think that would have made that would have made a big difference in the fire. And then in question three that I had, oh no, don't clap. Save your clap for the end. Question three that I had was we had uh, non-subcontractors, civilians out there fighting the fire on their stuff, and a couple of these um, subcontractors that hadn't been called yet are out there on their own, on their own risk. And uh, the story, you know, the legend is that Mountain Ranch was saved by um, a bunch of volunteers out there. They're, they're fighting on the fire lines. What can be incorporated from you guys to, to get these guys in? We're out in the sticks out here. We don't have the firefighters they have in the valley. We have people protecting their homes. And when they go out to get more diesel fuel and come back into the CHP, stops them. Um, what can you guys do to incorporate these guys into your program better in the future to fight these fires? Okay, so, so two questions. Two questions. So let's go back to question number one, and that was specific to local subcontractors. Local subcontractors. Right. And, and that's one of the things. Chief Evans and I spoke about it that very morning, and we, we identified the bulldozers that were available over on Highway 26, and, and we were expediting the process. We, we really tried to do everything. There is a process in, in, in state government, but there is a process to be able to go through. We expedited, and we got those dozers on contract, and we started utilizing them right away. 
Now, as far as talking about, are, are we speaking about volunteer firefighters? No. In the, or? No. Rancho. Rancho. Homeowner. Well, homeowner. I'll dive into my closing comments a little early, but, and, and I'll take it and extrapolate a little bit. What I ask is join the volunteer fire companies. Be a part of the organized volunteer because part of the reason is there are standards and training that we have to encapsulate. As fire chiefs, we are all responsible for those firefighters that are out there. And so we want to make sure that they're appropriately, that they have the appropriate personal protective equipment, that they have the training, that they know what they're doing. And by joining the volunteer fire department, they get all of that. They get all of it for free. And then on top of it, we've been hiring our volunteers to go out and work on the state fire for us. We're, we're working unified, but they're actually getting paid by the state. So I really, I can't emphasize enough the need for, if people want to be firefighters, please join. We are constantly recruiting volunteer firefighters. Chiefs, am I right? No. Oh. You don't want to be a firefighter for the chip to save your property and your home when you driving away and you think your home's burning to the ground and you no. got all the people up there taking selfies of the fire. That's very disappointing. That thought Indian golf coming up off of huge road. When we pulled out we thought our house burned to the ground but it didn't. But when we pulled up there was everybody setting up there taking pictures. Twelve trucks. Well, I'm sorry. So, uh, I mean, I'm sorry. You know, to hear you guys do a good job. We're not fishing about that, but it's really hard when you pull out and see stuff like that. It sure is. It disappoints me as well. Uh, was it Cal Fire or Strike Team from the city? That was Cal Fire. It was yeah, those are up on the hill. Well, maybe we can talk yeah, afterwards if you remember. Those if you remember any of the numbers off of those fire engines, we'll hold them accountable. Well, you're kind of in a panic when you. Yeah, I know. I understand what everything's going on. But that's but that's the example that we have. Okay, we'll talk afterwards. What I'd like to do is roll into, if I can, I'd like to roll into closing comments because we we're going to stay here and address your personal comments. We would like to have that discussion with everyone. First, I would like to recognize Supervisor Debbie Monty. Thank you for showing up. I understand. Thank you. We worked very closely with the Board of Supervisors and with all of the county department heads. Oh, I'm sorry. So, there's just not enough. We've already referenced pg e but we can't say enough about our partners that we work with throughout um, the state of California, and as well as partners that came from outside of the state of California. The Forest Service, pg e Sierra Pacific Industries, and as I mentioned before, they, they worked on contingency lines to work on and protect the communities along Highway 4 before they even protected their own land. These dozers worked tandem with our dozers and with our leaders, and they got those contingency lines cut in to protect those communities, and then we went across to the north from Highway 4 to protect their lands secondary. And I think that SBI just did a fantastic job. They were yeah. We have a mutual aid system that is second to none across the world. When, with the California National Mutual Aid, we were able to bring in firefighters from Berkeley, from San Jose, from LA, from San Diego, all over the state. And it was just an incredible um, response to be able to get those many fire agents on the road and up here helping us. Because honestly, we can't do it alone, but we know that. And to work with all of our local cooperators, we work hand in hand with everybody that you see in front of us here, working tirelessly to try to get this out, but we needed those reinforcements to help us out. So I really appreciate that. I'd also like to thank Incident Management Team 1 because I truly believe that they did a fantastic job. This was not an easy fire. This, this was a dynamic, complex fire, and every single day there were additional things that were constantly being thrown at them, and they handled it with professionalism, efficiency, and effectiveness. So I'd like to thank the team for that. Now those people that know me know that I'm an eternal optimist, right? I'm just always looking for the shining. But make no mistake about it, we are still in the middle of fire season. This is September. This is one fire. We got this one fire out. We are still in the thick of it. And we have to take the learning lessons that we already know, and we're still going to be looking for other learning lessons. But we have to take those learning lessons that we know now. 
when there's an evacuation order, whether you get it from Nixle or from Reverse 911 or for, from your neighbors, please take heed. Please just pack up everything and get out. Because I know that there's a number of people that want to stay and protect their structures. This is not the fire season for that. This is a very dynamic year. This fire is burning. This fire burns more rapidly and unlike any other fire that we have in the history of this area. The fires in this area, when they get into those canyons, they want to go up the canyon. This fire wanted to burn from the north to the south and encountered everything that we knew from fire history. So understand, when we talk about a four-year drought, we have the fuel moistures are so incredibly dry. The live fuels are dry. You can see it when you look at the trees. They're wilting. They're tired. They don't have that moisture. They, they are ready to burn. So please evacuate. Please take when you have an opportunity, when PG&E is out of the area, and you're driving through, go up and, and visit and, and drive through some of these roads. Because you'll see some of the homes that survived, and what we learned from that is the defensible space really works. It's not 100%, and I know and I understand that, and we can argue, I don't want to cause any argument, but it greatly increases the likelihood of your home surviving is that defensible space. There are a number of homes on the south side of Jesus Maria that survived because of the, the, the cattle, the horses that they had out there grazing it down. We don't have enough fire resources to partner when a fire is burning this rapidly. 50 acres a minute is what we are. 50 acres a minute. We can't keep up with that. It outpaces us. The other thing is that is to volunteer. If you're passionate about something, I ask you, this, this community, I, I said it before, Calaveras is resilient. We have to build back from this. Cal Fire is dedicated to being resilient and, and helping the community, but we all should be looking at how can we chip in and volunteer. Our fire safe councils do an enormous amount of work, and everybody on those fire safe councils is a volunteer. If that's not your cup of tea, look at, if you're into gardening, Master Gardeners. The Calaveras Master Gardeners, I hope, will be intimate in working with people to do additional um, landscaping and helping people landscape their yards in a fire safe manner. But regardless of what you want to do, there are there's different ways to volunteer, and I hope that everybody can reach out and, and help Calaveras heal from this, become more resilient and, and stronger. I believe we can. Thank you. Incident Commander for Incident Management Team 1, Phil Veneris. Good evening, my name is Phil. I am the Incident Commander for Team 1, and uh, it is my honor, it's my pleasure to be here tonight to address you. I appreciate the time that you took to come out and listen to us and to hear what we have to say. A couple things about the uh, Butte Fire. I've been an Incident Commander, uh, or Deputy Incident Commander, since 2008 seen a lot of fires, I've got a lot of teams in there. Currently there are six Cal Fire Incident Management teams comprised of about 55 people. And we've been to a lot of fires over the years, and I can tell you this is one of the most technical, the most difficult fires I've experienced as an incident commander, and as my team has experienced. We, we had a lot to do, deal with, and at one point there's close to 5,000 emergency workers under my command. It's not counting the law enforcement, Cooperators, not counting PGE, it's not counting what Red Cross is able to bear, it's not counting what you, your local churches, your local foundations put together to help the evacuees. It's just 5,000 emergency workers out there. Um, we had uh, between 18 and 20 helicopters, had uh, probably at any given time 10 to 15 uh, large airplanes, um, hundreds of uh, 115 bulldozers, hundreds of water tenders, hundreds and hundreds of uh, fire engines out there. Today, there's still 1,800 people out on the line working to defend those homes, to put the perimeter out, to ensure that those islands are in good shape, to uh, get those folks that, are, that were repopulated back in to safe homes. Um, and so again, as, as the Chief said, if you see smoke out there, if you see a uh, out there as you're back in the homes, please call one of my firefighters and talk to them. If you can't see a firefighter, if you need assistance, call 911 and ask for assistance. The Tuolumne Calaveras unit, the Amber El Dorado unit, Cal Fire, your local firefighters are here to help you. We'll be here for a long time. We'll be here until the rains come, until the snows fall. We're not going to leave you guys alone. The final thing I'd like to say to you is that I've got a lot of my firefighters on my team who came and helped me. Firefighters here, police department, they've been out 
they've been out working. It's been a very busy summer. I can assure you that everybody's been working up and down the state. Um, I've been on duty now for several weeks. I've got firefighters have been on duty for for uh, two months, two months plus. Be able to get home and not have a day off because it's just been such an unprecedented year of drought or the last four years of drought. But the support that you, the community, has given to my firefighters does help them, does lift them up. The parade down 49 the other day, my firefighters going to work, my firefighters coming back to work. Old guys come in and say that's the first time they've ever had that. The amount of uh, signs that are up, the little kids coming in and seeing them in the store and saying thank you is a really, really big deal to them. So I appreciate the support that you give my firefighters. I appreciate the support you give to your local emergency responders. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, firefighters, executive staff, local government, law enforcement, we will be here until the end. I ask that you on the back table, we have some recovery check uh, lists for your home, and come make contact with one of our PIOs, and we'll see you up with our recovery hotline. Thank you. 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 Thank you.